reading this morning from the 17th chapter of Luke, beginning at verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his feet, a face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. Our Father, we thank you for the word. So precious, so much here in this brief passage. Lord, we are inadequate to unfold it, to teach it, to put it into practice, but how we pray that by your spirit, you will be our teacher and you will be the one who ministers it to our, to our very being this morning and changes us from the inside out. Lord, we thank you for many things. We thank you for the day yesterday. All of the adults who pitched in and worked so hard, not only yesterday, but Friday, bringing things, sorting things, and then all the truth seekers and Bible believers, and even younger, all the kids making tens and dozens of trips to get all the stuff out there. And thank you so much for each one. Very grateful. Thank you for those who heard the gospel. Thank you for Kurt's great presentation. English and Spanish, it was, Lord, so encouraging. Thank you for the safe arrival of these babies and we pray for more who are coming. Thank you for Daniel Losey's continued health. We thank you for the way you've been ministering in Tim Hay's life and and in um, uh, Sheila's husband, Don, this past week. We just, Lord, we commit all of these things to you and there are many, many more that, that, that we could mention and We just ask that you will minister to the physical needs, but Father, far greater are the spiritual needs, and we're praying that by your Holy Spirit, you will be our God. You will teach us, and you will change us. We need that. We pray for that. Bless us now as we spend time in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn to Luke 17 if you're not already there. Such a wonderful passage. Most of you know that uh, Patty and I spend a little bit of time in Texas. We've had relatives down there for a long time. And uh, so we have occasion to go down there. And you, if you've been there, you know that Texans are proud of their state, right? I know Coloradans are too, but uh, it's different in Texas. I asked one guy one time, I said, were you born in Texas? He said, no, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got here as quick as I could. I mean, that's, that's how they feel about their state, right? And I think that would be a good attitude to have toward the kingdom of God, right? We're not born there. We are not born there. But it will be good to get there as quickly as we can. And so that raises the question, well, how do we become a part of the kingdom of God? The usual answer, be good. That's the ticket. Reform myself. Moralism. Trust in what you can do to get into the kingdom of God. That's what the Pharisees of Jesus' time were teaching. Moral reformation. You must be good. That's how you get in. Jesus hated that teaching. Jesus' message was totally different. His message was It's not about moral reformation. It's spiritual transformation that's required. Moralism will not make it. Moralism can make better sinners. Only spiritual transformation can make forgiven sinners, and that's what's required, beloved to be part of the kingdom of God. And that's what this passage is all about. Now, I realize this passage is usually used to teach thankfulness. That's because we don't study hard enough 
to find out what's really at the heart of this passage. There's a deeper meaning here. And the text is asking, is it moral reformation like the nine lepers who were cleansed outwardly but didn't experience anything inwardly? Or is it spiritual transformation that's required like the one? That's the question. And the answer from the lips of Jesus is that it is spiritual transformation which is so required. We must be clean, beloved, not just on the outside, but on the inside. In fact, we'll never make any progress on the outside until it begins on the inside. So let's look at this passage, three points, really, hardly ever get a three-point sermon, right? I got one today. (laughs) A few extra ones in between, however. Common condition, the common condition. Here we have 10 men who are lepers that Jesus meets on this road. They have a common condition of leprosy. We've talked about leprosy before. You know a little bit about it. Leprosy in its worst form, Hansen's disease, is a horrible, horrible disease that destroys the skin and destroys the sensitivity to feeling so that the extremities are eventually worn away. It, is a virtu- it was certainly a, a virtual death sentence in the, 21st, in the first century in which Jesus lived. Lepers were permanently condemned because of its contagious nature to be away from family, away from friends, away from the temple. They were ceremonially unclean. And so they had to live completely apart They were required when they came close to anybody to cry out unclean so that people would stay away from them and they would stay away from people. So here are 10 lepers and they have bound themselves together in their own little colony. Nobody else can have them. They can't be close to anyone else. And so they have formed their own little community and they have heard about Jesus. We don't know how, it's not told, but they know about Jesus and somehow they know that he's gonna be coming through this area. And so they meet him outside this little village in Palestine. They keep their distance as is required. They don't offend anybody. They don't get too close. They don't even get too close to Jesus. But as Jesus is coming through, they take advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to cry out, Lord, Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us. They realized a very important thing. They realized that mercy was their only hope. Jesus was the only hope they had. There was nothing else. Every other thing that they could have ever tried, every other possibility had been exhausted. There was no medical possibility for help for them. There was no religious opportunity for help for them. What they had heard about Jesus was the only hope they had, and so they pled for mercy. Now, I think it's significant that this is a mixed group. Did you notice that? It's a mixed group. At least one of these men was a Samaritan. And you remember from our past studies, the Jews and the Samaritans did not mix. They hated each other. And it wasn't just a simple hate. They were vociferous about it. We've talked about how the fact that the Jews, as they went from one end of their country to the other, as they went from Judea in the south, to Galilee in the north, Samaria being right in between, they actually avoided traveling through Samaria. They walked around in order to get from one place to another. That's how much they hated each other. And yet this common condition of leprosy has caused some people who ordinarily would never have given each other the time of day to band together in this horrible community of hopelessness and helplessness. And so here they come, the 10 of them. Now I think Luke shares this little tidbit with us on purpose. Leprosy is the Bible's most vivid depiction of the horror of sin. The dreadfulness of that condition, the dreadfulness of that physical reality is intended in the Bible to be a reminder of the horror of the spiritual reality of our own sinfulness, the hopelessness of our human condition, the the way that we are born doesn't seem all that bad to us. But from God's perspective, we have a terminal condition. And so leprosy is the one way that, that God 
teaches us this in this passage of Scripture. Now, so, so what does it teach us in this particular passage? And I think there are four quick things I want you to see about this human condition, the common condition that leprosy has. The leprosy of sin is universal. Sinfulness is the universal condition of humankind. There are no exceptions. It is our common experience. No one has ever lived who has been free from the natural penchant to rebel against God. Isaiah 53, 6 reminds us, we have all, like sheep, gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. There's the essence of sin defined for us in that passage of Scripture. It is to go our own way instead of God's way. Paul says in Romans 3, verses 10 and 11, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one seeks after God. No one seeks after God. So we are sinners by birth, and then very quickly we are sinners by choice. You can take it whichever way you want, and I think the Bible clearly teaches we sin because we're sinners and not the other way around, but it doesn't matter. We are sinners by choice and by birth. That is our common condition. Now, thankfully, we're not all equally evil. Not everyone is an axe murderer, right? Although we have some. Not everyone is a social outcast who would take the lives of others like we see on our television screens that ISIS is doing these days. Not everyone is a sexual predator. Not outwardly, at least. But God reminds us of this in James 2.10. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. You say, that's not fair. It should, be, it should be if my good outweighs my bad, it should be, that should be good enough. But I, you know, just, I, just, I just want you to think about this for a moment. How would you like to go to a heaven where the people who are there, their good outweighs their bad? Is that your concept of heaven? Is that a place of perfection? Or is that a place of eventually despair and hopelessness because sin will be there? God cannot stand sin. He cannot allow sin. And so we are equally in our, our guilt. The guilt is universal, and that's Luke's message here. This is our common condition. We are united in our lostness. Second thing we see here is that sinfulness creates an insensitivity that destroys. It creates an insensitivity that destroys. One of the, one of the, one of the major uh, characteristics of leprosy was that the person who was a leprosy gradually lost the ability to feel anything. Uh, starting at the extremities. We, we, we think of leprosy as eating away at the extremities of a person. That's not, not really what happened. Think about this. These people were living in the most horrendous um, uh, health conditions that you can imagine, right? Because they're outcasts. They're right? living out away from everyone else. So when they go to sleep at night and, and, and suddenly they're losing, they're feeling the rodents, the bugs, whatever else is around, eats away at their bodies and they have no way of knowing it. This is why they lose their extremities. This is why over time their body is diminished. It's because of this insensitivity that they have. They cannot feel pain. And similarly, beloved, the insensitivity to sin causes destruction in the human race, right? What does God say? The wages of sin is death. Started way back at the beginning, at the time of Adam, and it hasn't changed by the time that Paul is writing, and guess what? It's the same today. The wages of sin is death. The, inevitability, the, the, the inevitable result of sin in our lives is death and destruction. Now, mankind disagrees. Right? We live in a society that has a full-blown antipathy to the, idea, the whole idea of sin. We are culturally insensitive to sin. We do everything we can to deny it. We have a $50 billion industry that tells people your guilt is not real. Stop feeling guilty. Your sin is not real. 
Sin is just a leftover from our evolutionary heritage. There is no such thing. Sin, believe it or not, is a word that isn't even used in most churches these days on purpose. Man, that's, you, know what that's, you know what that's like? That's like building, it's like building a wing of a hospital, right? And saying, okay, but the word cancer is not going to be allowed here. We're not going to have any of that. But you see, the denial of the reality doesn't change the fact of the reality, does it? And the denial of sin doesn't change the fact of sin. And the destructiveness that it brings cannot be denied either. And sensitivity to sin destroys. Thirdly, sinfulness is incurable by human means. It's incurable by human means. Leprosy was a terminal disease. And the Bible says this in, John, in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately ill. Who can know it? And the word desperately ill there means incurably sick, terminally ill. Same word is used of David's son in 2 Samuel 12, verse 22, that he was desperately ill and he died shortly thereafter. No human intervention can cure Sin, nothing can cure it. Ritual cannot cure it. Some of the aesthetic practices that people go through, crawling on their knees for 900 miles in Spain in order to somehow atone for their sins, cannot cure the sin. Nothing humanly can do it. Good works cannot do it. Somehow making my good outweigh my bad is the basic idea, but good works cannot erase bad ones. They can't get rid of them. So there is no human cure for this. Now, sometimes, in fact, the good works can become their own form of rebellion. Good works is a cure for sin. It's like saying, I'm going to get rid of my asbestos poisoning by never, I'm never going to go in an old building again. It's too late. You've already got the asbestos poisoning, right? It's inherent in you. And that's what God is teaching us here. The common condition that we have of sin is incurable by human means. The Bible says it this way, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, Ephesians 1, right? You're dead. Not just, it's the wages of sin that, that, that has brought the principle of death into your life and spiritually you are insensitive to God. That's why you don't respond to God naturally. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. And guess what? Dead people don't cure themselves. The greatest example in the New Testament, in the Bible, of somebody being dead is Lazarus. And when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, remember what he said? Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus was resurrected from the dead. How much did Lazarus, what part did Lazarus play in that? He died. That was his part. Reminds me of the lady who was trying to join the church, you know, and they said, well, what have, you, what have you done to get right with God? She said, well, I did my part. God did his part. And they said, what was your part? She said, well, my part was sin. God's part was to save me. That's right. Right? And so fourthly, begging for mercy is the only hope. It's the only option. Do you notice these beggars didn't come to Jesus and say, hey, look, look, look at these sores. Look at these leprous sores, Jesus. Look, I, I put peroxide all over them this morning. I got this ointment from somewhere and I've covered it with ointment. I've, I've bandaged it over. I'm clean now. Could you just declare me clean so I can go back into society? They didn't do that. They did the only thing they could possibly do. They begged for mercy. And isn't this where the Bible points us? We'll get there Soon in Luke 18, where remember the, the tax collector who is praying against the Pharisee up there? What, what does the tax collector say? The only thing he can say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He begs for mercy, just like these men beg for mercy because it's the only hope that you have. But you know, before you'll ever pray that prayer, before you'll ever pray that God has mercy on you, before you'll ever pray a prayer of repentance and acknowledge the sinner that you are, that we all are, the common condition that we have as human beings, before you'll ever do that, you have to realize that you're lost. The main reason people don't come to Christ is because they're in denial about their lost condition, right? They won't believe it. 
One of my favorite restaurants in Fullerton, California, where we used to live, they had a bulletin board, you know, they had various announcements and so on, and I read one of them there one time, caught my attention, I wrote it down. Here was what was written. It was just a little note hanging on this bulletin board where people were advertising for jobs or different things, but this note said, I have taken the pill, I have hoisted my skirts to my thighs, dropped them to my ankles, rebelled at the university, skied at Aspen, lived with two men, married one, earned my keep, kept my identity, and frankly, I'm lost. I'm lost. And beloved, until we come to that realization that outside of Christ, we're as lost as you can possibly be. There is no hope. You don't go to the doctor for cure for cancer if you don't know you have cancer, right? So what Jesus is teaching here is we have a common condition. Our condition is that we are lost sinners. Second thing here, there is a common command in verse 14. Verse 14, Jesus says, when he saw them, he said to them, oh, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, this is interesting, right? Because notice Jesus didn't heal them right away. He gave the command. He said, go see the priests. Why did he send them to the priests? The priests couldn't heal them, right? The pri they, they would have gone to the priests immediately if they knew the priests were gonna be able to heal them. But of course, Jesus sent them to the priests because the priests were kind of like the health inspectors, first century health inspectors, right? Sometimes the skin disease that people had, and this was all written into the law of Moses in the Old Testament, sometimes the skin disease they had was acne, or sometimes it was something else that wasn't really leprosy, right? And so the priest, once they had gotten some kind of infection, the priest had to declare them righteous before they could join society again. And there was kind of a lengthy eight-day process that they had to go through with the, with the priest that demonstrated that they didn't really have leprosy. And so Jesus sends them off to get this health certificate from the priest, but he sends them before he heals them. So interesting. Now, you remember we, we ran into, if you, if you were here long enough ago, in Luke 5, verse 13, we ran into another leper, right? And what did Jesus do with that leper? He said to him, be clean. And what happened? He was clean. His leprosy was gone, just like that. Jesus cured him, and then he sent him to the priest. But here, he sends them to the priest without healing. Why? Why does Jesus do that? Well, I think two reasons. Number one, Jesus never works in the same way twice, or very seldom. That's why trying to put Jesus in a box of any kind is dangerous. Work this way here, so let's do it again over here. That's, that's our natural tendency. We go to seminars to find out how did they do it there. Let's do it the same way here. You know what our job is, beloved? Our job is to find out what does the Holy Spirit want to do uniquely in this place? That's our job. Jesus is not by any stretch of the imagination bound to do the same thing in the same way twice. But I think there's another thing that he's doing here and part of the message is he is soliciting faith based on his word. He's soliciting faith based on his word, just obedience. Why would you go show yourself to the priest when you still have leprosy? How about because Jesus told you to do so? Jesus is saying, I want you to believe my word rather than your lying eyes. I want you to believe my word rather than your lying emotions. I want you to believe what I said above anything. That's saving faith. Saving faith is always based on the Word of God, not the miracles of God, or not the feelings that we sometimes get about God, or not anything else. It's based on the Word. What does Jesus say in Romans 10, 17? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? Word of God. And that's what's being illustrated in this passage. He's saying, believe, believe me, believe me. Go show yourself to the priest. 
And so they take off, still, still with oozing sores and everything else. Assurance is always based on his word. Saving faith does one thing. It clings to the word of God. When God gave, remember in, back, way back in Genesis 15, God gave Abraham a promise. He promised him a land. He promised him people. And he promised that he'd be a blessing. And none of that was going on when God gave the promise. But it says what? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He believed the word before any of it ever came about. Saving faith clings to the word of God. So did they debate this command? We don't know. What we do know is they turned and left while they were still leprous because it says at the end of that verse, as they went, they were cleansed. Literally while going, they were cleansed. They weren't cleansed and then decided to go. They decided to go and then they were cleansed. And what Jesus is illustrating here for us is the fact that saving faith, beloved, acts. We think of faith as just being a belief, and it is. It starts with that. But saving faith eventually has to reach out. Let me illustrate this. This is really simple. Think of a guy bobbing along out in the ocean there, right? He's about to go under for the third time. The waves are overwhelming him. And a boat comes along and they throw him a life buoy out of the boat and he looks at it and there it sits on the water. It's two feet away. Salvation is right there. So he's saved, right? He believes that that life buoy, if he'll just grab it, can save him. He's saved, right? Not really. Not until what? Not until he reaches out and grabs on. Saving faith acts. Saving faith reaches out to God. Saving faith isn't just believing that Jesus died for our sins and that he rose again. That's the starting point. But what's the very next thing that, that verse in Romans says? It says, and it is, and, and it is that we are justified by faith and then it becomes, we, we, we're justified when we publicly acknowledge the faith. That's the first act of faith. It's reaching out and taking it doesn't mean we're saved by our works, but it means that true saving faith will eventually, and in fact, right away result in reaching out. You've got to reach out and take it. The gift is there. But you can look at it all day long, and you can stare at it, and you can say, I believe it. But until you put your faith on the line, no salvation. We have to act on the faith that God gives us. So there's a common condition, there's a common command. What's but about the third thing? The uncommon commitment. The uncommon commitment that we see in verses 15 to 19. This is, this is the really sad reality. There's a, there's, a, there's a tremendously sad reality to this story. Here it is. These men are a, a visual representation of what can happen spiritually. They're, they're a physical representation of a spiritual truth, right? They are living out, they're a living illustration. Um, they're a living, um, they're a living uh, way, way of presenting a truth. Their physical cleansing illustrates the possibility and the need for spiritual cleansing. But nine of them never made that connection. Nine of them never got it. Here they are. They're God's object lesson. And they don't get the lesson. Is that sad or what? That makes me want to cry. They didn't get it. Even though God was using them to teach this truth, they never got it. They had a spark of faith to receive God's blessing of physical healing and they got it. But all they ever got was clean on the outside. They never got clean on the inside. Only one of them made the connection, made the total connection. The, the rest of them were satisfied just to use God, to get the blessing that God would give, to get the temporary benefit, but they never really knew God. Boy, that's, that is sad. Calvin says it this way. He says, it is too common a disease 
that when we are urged by strong necessity, like leprosy, illness, cancer, you name it, when we are urged by strong necessity and we have obtained our wishes, we got our healing or whatever it is, ungratefulness swallows up that feeling of piety. Thus poverty and hunger beget faith, but abundance kills it. Crazy. But abundance kills it. So it was with these nine. Incredible, but temporary physical healing prevented their spiritual renewal. But this isn't about thankfulness. This is about regeneration, which they never got. Healing led them, think of it this way, healing led them away from Christ instead of toward Christ. That's sad. So verse 15, and one of them, one out of the 10, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Do you recognize the word turned? We heard it many, many times in the Bible. What does it mean? It means repent. The word turn, when you hear it in the Bible, always means you could see equivalent basically to the word repent because the word repent means what? To turn around, to go another direction, to turn from self toward Christ. So this is what Luke is telling us here. When this man was healed physically, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Everything's been common up till now. They had a common condition. They had a common command. They took off in a common direction, but now no longer. Something has happened in the heart of one that did not happen in the hearts of the others. One grasped what it was all about. One grasped that this physical healing was a, was a sign of potential for spiritual healing, and he decided he wanted that. Listen, think about this guy. He's, this guy's been a leper. We don't know for how long, but long enough that he's formed a community. He's with these other nine. He's realized his helpless condition. He's lived with it probably for years. Hasn't been able to see his family. Hasn't been able to be around anyone he knows and loves during all that time. The one thing that he would want wanted all that time above anything else is what? To be physically healed. Wanted to be rid of that leprosy. Had long ago given up the hope, but that was the one thing. If he could have had any wish that he could have had, it would have been what? To be physically healed. To be done with the leprosy. And yet all of a sudden, as he considers what has just happened, he realizes it's not just the physical healing that he has, and he realizes that's a minor consideration compared to his need for reconciliation with God, compared to his need for forgiveness and for cleansing. He recognizes that. The others never get it. So he turned around. He did the thing that's required to be right with God, right? To repent. He turned around. Did he invite the others to follow? We don't know. But we know that he got something they didn't get. You say, how do you know that? Well, be because I read it. Just, you read, you learn a lot in the Bible, right? I read it. Look what it says. He turned back, praising God with a loud voice, phonas megales, megaphone. He was... Loud, talk about proclaiming publicly. He was doing that. And, and notice verse 16, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Who did he praise? God. Where did he do it? At the feet of Jesus. Now think about this for a minute. Did Jesus stop him and say, hang on, man, listen, thanks a lot, but just stand up. I'm just a man like you are. Don't be worshiping me. Don't be praising God at my feet. You stand up and praise God on your own. Jesus do that? No. Why? Because Jesus is God. Luke is showing us one more time here the wonderful truth that he has shown us over and over and over in this book. He's showing us the unmistake in unmistakable terms the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to turn with me to the fourth chapter of John. If you're in Luke, you just turn over. Next book is John, Luke, John chapter four. Because we gotta go a little deeper here. John chapter four. Keep in mind that this leper who turned, returned was a Samaritan, right? A Samaritan. What do we know about Samaritans? 
Here's one of the key things we know about Samaritans. Samaritans worshiped at a different temple than the Jews did, right? Samaritans, 900 years before this, had started worshiping at Mount Gerizim, which was a place up where they lived in the middle of the country in, 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 in Samaria. Mount Gerizim, that's where they worshiped. The Jews worshiped down here in the south, in Judea, in Jerusalem, because that's what the law told them. They had to worship in Jerusalem. They had synagogues all over the place, all over the world by this time, but the only place they could worship, the only place they could offer sacrifices was in Jerusalem. The priests who lived all around the country, when they came to do their priestly duty once or twice a year, where did they go? To Jerusalem. So there's this controversy going on. So when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in John 4, remember that? Jesus comes to meet this woman. He goes through Samaria. While the Jews usually, usually went around, he went right through Samaria because it says he has an appointment with this woman. He, he gets into a conversation with her about water. Remember all that? And he asks her for a drink and then he eventually begins to tell her about living water and eventually he says, well, why don't you go fetch your husband? And she says she doesn't have one. So Jesus says this in John 4. Let's pick up in verse 17. You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. Shocking up is not new, right? The one you have is not your husband. What you've said is true. She is exposed, right? She did not expect this answer, I can promise you. So what does she do? What most of us would do. She changed the subject. Verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I per perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Wasn't hard to do, right? Perceive that you're a prophet, telling her the details of her personal life. I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Let's get an argument going. That'll take, that'll take the heat off over here. We'll just argue about where we should be worshiping, right? Why did she say that? Because she worshiped in Mount Gerizim and she knew Jesus, a Jew, would be worshiping in Jerusalem. So Jesus replies in verse 21, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Well, that's a showstopper, isn't it? Jesus is a Jew. What would you expect him to say? You would expect him to say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. That's what the law says. Jerusalem, you have to worship in Jerusalem. And he says, he says neither, neither, neither place is right, so what's going on? Well, in order to understand what's going on there, first, first we have to understand the, what is the temple all about? What's the history of the temple? And remember from the time that God first had a tabernacle in the wilderness, which was the first temporary form of the temple, the center of it was at the core of that tabernacle was a was a place called the Holy of Holies. Remember that? And inside that Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, there was the Ten Commandments, one of the things that was buried in it. Then there was the mercy seat that was on top of it. And then in that Holy of Holies, there was a cloud. The cloud that had led the children of Israel out of Egypt. Who was that? That was God. That was a physical representation of God with his people. And it was there. It resided in the Holy of Holies. Only the priest ever saw it once a year, right? God was all but unapproachable. But he could be approached on the basis of a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. And so once a year, the priest would go in and on behalf of the people, he would offer sacrifice for sin and the Ten Commandments that was condemning them under the mercy seat was now covered with blood on the mercy seat so that God the Father could forgive on the basis of the, of the sacrifice. God met his people in the Holy of Holies. That's what the temple was about at the core of his meaning. It's the place where God met his people. That's what the temple is. But 
there's been a change of monumental proportions. You want to know what the change is? John 2. Just turn back. If you're in John 4, turn back to John 2. Early in his ministry, Jesus has come into the temple in Jerusalem and he has cleansed it. He's cleansed it of the merchants, of the people that really belonged to the priestly caste, to the Sadducees. They were under their control. They were charging onerous interest rates. They were charging huge amounts of money for lambs and, and goats for the sacrifices that had to be made in the temple that were required. And so Jesus cleaned them all out. When we were in Jerusalem, we were able to see right on the edge where the temple was, we were able to go into the openings of some of the shops that were there just outside the temple where this very thing went on. They're still there today. They've been uncovered by the archaeology there. Jesus cleaned them all out. And of course, the guys that were making the money from this, the Jewish elite, were apoplectic. Who are you to be doing this? And so they come to Jesus in John chapter 2 and verse 18. The Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. You have to realize this temple had been already in building 46 years at this point in time. 46 years wasn't done yet. It was another 16 plus years before it was done. It was a, it was a mammoth undertaking. So they said in verse 20, the Jews said it's taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Here's what Jesus was saying in John 2 so casually that even his own disciples didn't get it yet. It's going to be later before they get it. But what he was saying to them in this chapter in John 2 was, hey guys, guess what? There's a new temple in town and it's me. There's a new and final sacrifice for sin instead of all these animals and goats and lambs that you've been slaying all these years. There's a new ultimate sacrifice and it's me. There's a new place where God meets his people. And it's me. Isn't that an amazing thing that Jesus is doing right there at the beginning of his ministry? And of course, it follows through the rest of his ministry. It's all about Jesus, beloved. He's the center of everything. The moment he arrived on earth, everything changed. So now... Back to Luke 17 and that 10th leper. Think about his dilemma. When Jesus said, go see the priests, what was his problem? He didn't know whether to go to Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim, right? He's a Samaritan. He doesn't know what to do. He has the same question in his mind that the woman at the well had. Well, where's the right place? which is the right place. But while this guy is contemplating this question, all of a sudden, his skin is no longer scaly. It's no longer hard. The oozing sores are suddenly gone. The extremities are back like new. His skin looks like a baby's skin. And when that happened, let me tell you, the lights went on for this guy. And he writes, this is not just about the healing from physical deformity here. It's one thing to go to the priest and get a certificate of physical healing. It's another thing to get a certificate of spiritual health. And he realized neither Gerizim nor Jerusalem is going to matter for that. And so what does he do? He goes back to the place where God now meets his people to Jesus, because there's a new temple in town and it's at the feet of Jesus. I'm not suggesting that he understood all of this, but what he got was Jesus is everything. He's the only thing that matters. He's the only place I'm going to find physical healing and therefore is the only place I'm going to find spiritual healing. He knew that. And so he came back to the feet of Jesus. 
Luke worded it this way on purpose, beloved. This man worshiped God at the feet of Jesus because that's the only place God can be found, right? He worshiped at the feet of Jesus because that's the only place where Jesus can be, where God can be found. It's not in a church. It's not in a temple. It's not anywhere except at the feet of Jesus. It takes your breath away, doesn't it? What's going on here? And that's just what Jesus is communicating when he says in verse 17, we're not 10 cleansed, where are the nine? Was no one found to return, to repent? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? See, Jesus sent them away, yes, but he sent them away in the hope that they would come back, that they would come back for the greater healing that is available only through him and at his feet. It's not thanks that Jesus was looking for. If you think that's all he was missing here, you have missed the point of this parable. It's regeneration. It's not moral reformation, the outward cleansing. It's spiritual transformation, the inward cleansing. That's what Jesus is looking for. That's what marks saving faith. How do you know? Because I read it. Look what else he says. Your faith has made you well. Okay, I'll give you a waiver here. Because in English, it looks like he's saying your faith got, you, got your leprosy gone, right? It's not what he said. I don't know why they translated it this way. As far as I know, every English version does this. Every one of them misses it. What Jesus said to this man is your faith has sojo, sojo you, sozo, salvation, saved you. The same word that's used in Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved, sozo, through faith. It's a terrible translation. Your faith has saved you. He wasn't talking about his physical salvation from leprosy. He was talking about his spiritual transformation. He was talking about the fact that he had come from death to life. He had come from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Your faith has saved you. All of them were made physically well. Only one was made spiritually well, forgiven, saved. Only one, and he a foreigner at that. Only one recognized the only way to the Father is through the Son. There's a new temple in town, and it's Jesus. It's the only way to the Father. That's why Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So at the feet of Jesus, this man found cleansing because he repented. He turned back. So what happened to the other nine? Well, I can tell you what happened to the other nine. The other nine are like the five-year-olds who were in their class one Sunday and the Sunday school teacher was telling them about how Solomon built this wonderful temple. And she talked to them about how once Solomon filled, got that wonderful temple, the presence of the Lord filled that temple and the kids' eyes got big. They were all excited. She could tell they were all excited. She got excited and then she realized they didn't think it was God's presence that filled that place. They thought it was God's presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, -E -E that filled that place. This is what the nine settled for, the presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, -E of God. Yeah. They got physically healed. What they didn't get was the presence, the P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E -E -E of God. Beloved. Don't stop short. Don't stop short of where the gift is. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Only at the feet of Jesus. Moral reformation will not cut it. 
only spiritual transformation. Let's pray. Father, so much here, so much to try to digest. And yet the basic message is just the same one presented in another form again. The message of salvation through faith, saving faith, faith that acts, faith that grabs on to the word of God and hangs on for all that it's worth, whether it feels right or not, whether everything happens the way we want, we just trust the word, we believe the word, we're not gonna let it go. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today who's been trusting in moralism, being good, Lord, please destroy all the good works. Show them that it didn't mean anything that they came to church this morning other than hopefully they heard a word that maybe they never heard before. It doesn't mean anything that they've been baptized when it comes to salvation. Are those things good? Yes. Are they necessary? They're, they're, they're not for salvation. They show that the salvation is real eventually. You want good works. You've created us for good works. If, we, if our saving faith is real, we'll be there. But the, but the faith that saves Faith that saves just grabs onto the word of God and hangs on because then the spirit is transformed from the inside out. That's what you say. You make us a new creation in Christ. So thankful for that. Thankful for this word. Pray now, Lord, as we sing this hymn in closing, if there's anyone here who hasn't made that decision, give them today the courage to not only in their heart of hearts Confess themselves a sinner, but come and acknowledge it. And let us help them. Give them some literature that helped them understand what it means to be and to live a Christian life. Thank you so much for the privilege, for the provision you make that you've made at the cross for our forgiveness. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.